Hypothesis testing is a set of methods that we use to determine an outcome of an experiment. In kind of a formal sense, it encompasses a variety of methods that are used to compare experimental samples using statistical probabilities. We're going to use the statistical behavior of experimental data to try to predict whether or not that data is behaving the way that we expect it to. If it's behaving in a way not commensurate with being part of a population, then we can kind of determine that uh, to a specific level of confidence that there is a difference in those populations. And so hypothesis testing has a lot of different ways to do that depending on the test we want to run. In general, there are three characteristics that we're going to work with that are going to be part of just about every hypothesis test we would do. First, we have a null hypothesis. When we formulate a scientific hypothesis, what we really need to do is construct a statement that is testable, something that we can test with a statistical method. The null hypothesis is a very important part of that and uh, is kind of a peculiar statement. It is the statement that there is no detectable difference between the samples or populations. What I mean by that is we're going to make the statement that, say I make a change, I'm going to tweak a, a knob on a manufacturing process and the null hypothesis would state that I tweaked the knob and no change was made and the null hypothesis is specifically what we are going to test and we'll see why that is but in a statistical sense I cannot prove the null hypothesis but I can reject the null hypothesis and by rejecting it in lieu of the alternative hypothesis I show that there is a difference with a statistical significance so we generally refer to that as H0, the null hypothesis. As I mentioned, there's also an alternative hypothesis. So the alternative hypothesis is that there is a detectable difference between the samples or populations that we want to show. And that difference might be a one-sided difference or it might be a two-sided difference. In other words, we might just want to show, we want to test the hypothesis that one population is greater than the other. And that changes the way that we would test that hypothesis. But So we need these two that we're going to compare and perhaps reject the null in favor of the alternative hypothesis depending on what the outcome is. To do that we're going to use what's called a st test statistic. And this is the governing statistical characteristic that we use to make that comparison. So we've got a number of different probability density functions. In other words, we've got a number of different functions that describe probabilities in different situations. One example is the normal probability distribution. We have a lot of variables that are defined by the normal distribution, the bell curve. And so the test statistic would be related to the behavior of that curve. In that case, the test statistic would be Z. Before we get too deep into a discussion of how hypothesis testing exactly works, it might be useful just to kind of walk through some basics to give you a refresher on probability and how some of these things are governed and that way you can kind of understand where we're coming from. So let's say that we are a manufacturer of 6061T6 aluminum and we're interested in the ultimate tensile strength and our customer is really interested in the variable ultimate tensile strength. And we know from our manufacturing experience from all the production that we've made, we've taken lots and lots and lots of measurements over a long time and we know that we make it with an average of 48 KSI and we hold a standard deviation in our production of 4 KSI and this is on the ultimate tensile strength. So if we were to take a lot of measurements then we would wind up with this what we call the population mean or the mean of all the values put together. If we take a zillion measurements we would wind up with a mean of 48 KSI and a standard deviation of 4, 4 KSI. So uh, we know this about our production. If I was to take five samples just of five measurements each, so I'm going to go in first thing in the morning and I'm going to take five measurements of ultimate tensile strength uh, off of our production line and I'm going to get the points that we see here on one. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, two of them are stacked here. Uh, and the orange cross represents the mean of that sample. And I come in, say, after the first break, around 10 a.m., and I take another sample from the same population. We haven't changed anything about our production. And I'm going to get five different points. As a result, I'm going to get a different sample mean. Statistics would dictate that this would happen, that because I'm taking a small sample out of a population, my sample mean is 
is going to be close to my population mean, but it's never going to be exact, exactly on top of it. It's never going to be an exact predictor of the population mean. So we have what we normally refer to as the uncertainty in the mean value, and it's related to the number of measurements that I take and the standard deviations of those measurements, and that's how we relate how close these values, these orange crosses are, to the population mean that we know in this case to be 48 KSI. So we see that the population means all dance kind of around the, the sorry, the sample means dance around the population mean. And if I were to take a bunch of sample means, they would eventually equal the population mean if I were to average those up. So what if I take a lot more samples? Let's say I, or a lot more measurements in my sample. Let's take 10. If I take 10 measurements, I get a different set of sample means. In fact, I get a different sample mean no matter how many measurements I take. But we notice that these look a little bit closer, hover a little bit cl more closely to the population mean. The reality being, if I took 11 bajillion measurements, then I would have exactly the population mean. My sample mean would converge to my population mean. So, in other words, it, what we see here is kind of a predictor of the population mean and the bigger sample I have, the better the predictor is. So let's co-plot the five measurement samples with the 10 measurement sample means and see what that So as we kind of expect, the more samples, or sorry, the more measurements we take in a given sample, the more accurate our sample mean is going to reflect the population mean. So you might ask yourself, why is this useful? This is kind of a contrived discussion, where are we going with this? Well, here's the thing. I can call the population, so I, I'm, I'm producing 6061T6 aluminum, and I can identify the stuff that I make because I'm really consistent with it, and I know the population characteristics. If I make a change in my production, if I make some significant change, I want to identify whether that change has affected the ultimate tensile strength. So we're getting values hovering right around 48 KSI. If I make a change and then take a sample and I get some sample mean way out here, just in a visual sense, we can say, well, hey, that looks like it might have changed. It, it, it may have changed the population mean. We don't often have this information about the population. We often have to infer what we can from samples only because we don't have enough time or money to take continuous measurement of a process. So often we have to use samples to make these inferences and so we might have a small sample from before making a change and a small sample from after making the change and we need to compare the two together and say does this represent a significant change for example in ultimate tensile strength based on the change in the process that I made. So knowing this statistical behavior, the statistical distribution of the sample means around the population mean, we can calculate probabilities. And so if I can characterize the probability that this point is out here as being really, really improbable, then we can say, well, it's improbable that those are from the same quote unquote population. This one represents a different type of aluminum or a, a, an aluminum with a different process. And therefore, we can test the hypothesis that they are the same. And if we reject that hypothesis, then we can statistically show that they're So let's look at an example. Let's say I take a sample, and I'm going to take five measurements. And I get a sample mean of 48.7 KSI and a sample standard deviation of 1.86 KSI. This is actually equivalent to the last point a couple of graphs ago. Uh, the, the last sample, sample number five. So the sample means are distributed about the population in a T distribution, which is similar to a normal distribution or a bell curve. In fact, if I had taken a, a bunch of measurements, 30 or more measurements, the T distribution would look so much like a normal distribution, we'd just call it a normal distribution. So we know that sample means are distributed about the population mean according to an effective standard deviation. This isn't exactly a standard deviation, but an effective standard deviation of the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples. This is where we see if I take 11 bajillion samples, this is going to converge to zero and I'm going to have a perfect estimate 
of the uncertain of the uh, population mean. The t distribution also requires a number of degrees of freedom. It varies with that, and so uh, it's dependent. The shape of the curve, uh, the probability density function, is dependent on the number of samples we take. In this case, uh, nu is n minus one. This is a Greek letter nu, and so we have four degrees of freedom. So let's think about this example for a moment. I'm going to take this sample of five data points with a sample standard deviation of 1.86 ksi. What would the maximum distance between the sample mean and the population mean be 95% of the time? And I'll show you where I'm going with this here in a second. So what I'm trying to ask with this particular question is, 95% of the time, can I tell how far away the sample mean would be at a maximum? Uh, we can do that. Sure, absolutely. We know that according to the t distribution, with four degrees of freedom, the t value, or the number of standard deviations, effective standard deviations, away from the mean that we would go 95 to encompass 95% of our data would be 2.776 in either direction. So if we go 2.776 times s over the square root of n, either to the right or left, of our mean, we uh, of the sample mean, we know that the population mean will be in there somewhere. Another way to look at that is that the difference between the population mean and the sample mean will, 95% of the time, be less than 2.776 effective standard deviations away. So we have this math here to show this. This is the actual equation for uncertainty in the mean value, that the population mean is equal to the sample mean plus or minus t at the number of degrees of freedom and the confidence interval that we're interested in, in other words, we have a 95% certainty in our result, times the sam sample standard deviation, s, over the square root of n. With a little bit of algebra and hand-waving, we can come up th with the expression that the difference between the two at a maximum is going to be plus or minus, I left the plus or minus out here, t s over the square root of n, or 2.776 times, in this case, 4.13 ksi, the sta sample standard deviation, which is usually going to be pretty close to the population standard deviation, we can see that, divided by the square root of the number of points. So in this case, for five measurements, we have that there shouldn't be, at least 95% of the time, there will not be more than about 5 ksi between the sample mean that we get from just taking a small sample and what the actual population mean is. If we run the same thing again with 10 measurements, just really quickly before we really get into where, where I want to go with this, if we run it with 10 measurements, we're again going to get a roughly similar number for the sample standard deviation. It's probably going to be pretty close to the population standard deviation. And we notice that with more points, we get a better estimate of the mean. We've already said that. This is how we know, because the difference between the population mean and the sample mean is dependent on the same equation. T95 gets smaller and N gets bigger. So we now have 2.262, where before we had 2.7. And we're now dividing it by the square root of 10, whereas before we were dividing it by the square root of 5. Therefore, we get with 10 measurements, with really basically the same sample statistics, we now have an estimate to within 3 KSI. So by taking more points, we can show a significant difference between a sample and a population with a smaller deviation in the mean. So this is useful. We'll get to that. But how is this useful? If we think about probability, this means that if I were to take a sample of 10 measurements and I got a sample mean that was 4 KSI away from the population mean, then there would only be a 5% chance that that sample was actually from that population. Let me say it another way. I make a small tweak in my manufacturing operation. and I take a sample after that result, a 10 measurement sample after making that change. And what I wind up with is a sample mean that is 4 KSI away from what I expect the population mean to be. I know that there is a 95% chance that I'm going to get a population mean within 3 KSI, which means I only have a 5% chance that that didn't cause a change.
and that's how we do a hypothesis test. That's what hypothesis testing is all about. It's about using the probabilistic behavior of these groups of the samples, of the sample means, the sample variances, and standard deviations according to the probability density functions that define them to determine whether or not it's likely that a change has taken place. And this is useful for making a lot of different statements. So let's look at an example of a hypothesis test. Let's say we work for this manufacturer of 6061T6 aluminum and our cooler goes down. The, the cooler for our quench water decides to to die and so our quench water is now warmer. The question is, has that affected the average ultimate tensile strength of our product? Have we experienced a shift up or down of the average ultimate tensile strength? So how would we determine this? Well, first things first, let's take a sample of those ultimate tensile strength measurements. Let's take a few measurements. We, we don't have enough time or money, et cetera, to take a zillion measurements, so we're gonna take you know maybe five or 10. And so we're going to take that sample. Then we're going to compare our sample mean because we want to know whether there's a difference in the means and the averages. So we're going to compare the sample average to the previous population average or mean, mu, z, mu naught. And we're going to look at the relative distance between those two. We know that the probability of these mean values is dictated by a t distribution. Or if you don't know, now you do. Uh, so there's a probability distribution based on the behavior of these means with respect to each other. And we can determine the probability of obtaining that sample mean if there was no effect. In other words, if our null hypothesis was true, that there is no effect induced by this hotter or warmer quench water, then the probability of obtaining that sample mean can be calculated. And we can say, well, if there was no change, what's the probability that I got this? If that probability is high, if the probability that I would have wound up with this sample mean is relatively high, in other words, if they're pretty close together, then I don't have evidence in of any change from the original mu naught population average to, to the new population average. I'm not showing much change because there's a high probability that this point is in line with the original. If the probability that I would have obtained those values is really low, that means that there is evidence of a change and I can reject that null hypothesis in lieu of the alternative hypothesis, that there is a difference. We usually test to the 95% probability or 95% confidence level. And when I say confidence level, what I mean is that for a 95% probability that we will fail to reject the null if it truly should not be, that's a 95% confidence level. In other words, there's a 95% chance that we are going to we are going to show with our statistical data that there is no change if there is indeed no change this means that there's a 5% chance that we will not show a change if there is no change so in this case our null hypothesis was that the ultimate tensile strength was not affected. In other words, the new population mean is equal to the original population mean mu not that's H0. The alternative hypothesis that we're putting forward is that the ultimate tensile strength was affected. Now in this case, we didn't say whether it was improved or uh, so increased or decreased. We just said that the tensile strength was affected. So any difference, positive or negative, would cause the alternative hypothesis to be true. In this case, that dictates whether we use a single-tailed t-test or a two-tailed t-test. In this case, because we could go either way, we use a two-tailed t-test. If you wanted to say, well, the alternative hypothesis, I want to know whether the ultimate tensile strength was greater after the fact, that would be a single-tailed t-test, and it would basically uh, change your t-value based on the probabilities. So the test statistic in this case, again, this is a t-test that we use to compare small samples to a population mean. We actually used a t-test to compare means of all different types. But in this case, we're going to use a t-test uh, as a comparison of the small sample to the population mean. And to do that, we see the equation. The t-value is going to be the difference between the sample mean and the population mean over the sample standard deviation over the square root of n. This is how we dictate the probabilities in the t-distribution, and we're going to compare that to some critical t-value and see whether our s result is significant. So let's look at it, uh, some actual numbers. So let's 
take our original population mean, mu naught is 48 KSI. And let's say we increase the temperature of our quench water, and we want to know, has this affected the average ultimate tensile strength of our product? So we take a sample of five measurements. Uh, five measurements is a bare minimum. Basically, you don't want to take fewer than five. Uh, any more than 15 to 20 is probably overkill, depending on what you're doing. Remember that because this is inversely proportional to the square root of n, by taking more measurements, you can improve your results somewhat, and you can reduce your error. Uh, you can reduce what's called your type 2 error. Without the population variables, you can't actually calculate your type 2 error. But uh, by taking more variables, you get somewhat better results, but it costs more. So 5 is kind of a bare minimum in an experimental sense, unless you're doing a much wider experiment that requires you to take fewer. You can take down to 3, but that's, that, that's pushing it. So usually I go between 5 to 10, uh, 10 being kind of the expensive side, or if I expect a lot of variability. So at any rate, we're going to take 5 sample measurements, and we get a sample mean of 46.1 KSI, and a sample standard deviation of 4.72 KSI. And I want to know whether this is a statistically significant difference from the original population mean. So to do this, we calculate our t-value, and we see that we have the difference between the two means here, 46.1 minus 48. So we're 1.9 KSI away. And if we convert that to effective standard deviations, we have 4.72 over the square root of 5. So we have a t-value of 0 0.9. If you think back to the standard distribution, the normal distribution, uh, bell curve. We know that uh, the data is distributed such that within plus or minus one standard deviation, we have 68% of the data. Plus or minus two standard deviations, we have about 95% of the data. And plus or minus three standard deviations, we have 99.7% of the data. The T distribution behaves similarly, but at lower levels of degrees of freedom. So in this case, we only have four degrees of freedom. That behavior is similar, but uh, expanded a little bit. So you're going to have to go a little bit further away from the mean to get a certain uh, uh, probability. So in this case, we got a t value of 0 0.9. If this were the uh, standard normal distribution, then we would be 0 0.9 standard deviations away from the mean. Effectively, that's, that's what I'm trying to communicate. So in this case, we look up the 95% confidence level for a two-tailed t-test with four degrees of freedom, and we find that the t-value critical is 2.776. What this means is my t-value from my experiment, this t naught, would have to be greater than 2.776 to show a statistically significant difference. We are one-third of the way there. This is very, very close to our original mean in those terms. In other words, t naught is so much smaller than the critical value of t95 that the probability that we have experienced a change is very low. So t naught is less than t95, and therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level. That's that. We look up t95. If our calculated t-value is less than that, then we fail to reject the null. And the way we would phrase that is to say that there is no statistical evidence to show that there is an effect on the average ultimate tensile strength of our product based on the new quenched water temperature. So we cannot say that there is no effect. We can only say that there is no statistical evidence to support that we may come up with results that are varied. Remember that we're talking about probabilities here, not assured behavior. If we were to conduct this experiment again and again, then we could understand much better or on a much more complete term. But no matter what, we can only make the statement that there is no evidence to support this. You may have read in the, in the news, you know, they've got this new wonder drug and it's going to do all these things. But then when you actually break down and read the... Um, the report, their verbiage, by the, the verbiage by the scientists, is much more reserved in saying, well, we can or we can't show a statistical difference. And that's really what the basis of pretty much all well-conducted experiments are. Now, the question is, we were like one-third of the way to actually showing a difference. What level of significance would we have to go to to actually reject the null?
In other words, what probability that I would be rejecting the null incorrectly would I have to accept to be able to show, to say that there's a difference? That's what we call the p-value. The p-value is the probability that t0, well, the, the p-value is the probability that uh, at the level of t0, if we were to reject it, we would be wrong. In this case, we would have a 42% chance of being incorrect to reject the null in light of the data that we have because of how, how far away that is. So just saying that T0 is less than T95 just tells us whether we failed or reject it. Say we succeeded in rejecting it. Another more important characteristic is to look at the p-value. If p was 0 0.00001, then I would only have a 0 0.00001 chance or a 0 0.001 or one in 1,000 chance of being incorrect should I reject the null. That is a, a slightly more powerful statistic. So it's just kind of going backward. Instead of just comparing T0 to the 95% level of significance, we're actually ca calculating the level of significance of rejecting that result. So in this case, we would have a 42% chance of being wrong if we were to say that there was a difference. That's a little too high. I want a 5% or less chance of being wrong by rejecting the null, if I'm going to reject it. So the, the p-value is generally accepted as a way to do that. And if you use any standard calculators to do a t-test or an f-test, etc., it's going to give you the p-value. So usually I just go straight to the p-value. What is it? If it's less than 0.05, then I show a difference and I reject the null. If it's more than 0.05, then I don't reject the null. So there are a couple of different uh, test distribution statistics in, in common use. The two most common are the t-test and the f-test. First, the t-test is to show differences in means. In other words, was there a change in the average value? In the case that we just discussed, was there a change in the average ultimate tensile strength? And so to do that, we use a t-distribution. Here are some example questions. Does quench water temperature affect yield strength? Does O-ring hardness affect average leak pressure? Is the average pressure capacity of an air tank above a specification? In other words, I can compare this just to a known value. It doesn't even have to be to a population. I can just say, based on this uh, sample, can I say that the population has a mean that is greater than uh, any given value, just some arbitrary value. Um, so we can compare the means, whether we're comparing two sample means to each other, a sample mean to a population mean, or a sample mean to just an accepted value. We do that with a t distribution, and there are different ways to do those uh, those calculations. And you can look up the specific equations that you use. You'll use a t distribution each time, but the way that you calculate the confidence intervals is different. Likewise, with the f distribution, we are looking at differences in variances. In other words, was there a change in the standard deviation? Uh, this is an F distribution and the test statistic is, is F0. And the example questions here are a little bit different. Uh, a similar question to what we did before would be, does quench water temperature affect the variation in yield strength? So maybe I'm not interested in shifting that yield strength up or down, but in making my results more cohesive. This is really important for process control and manufacturing processes, or for being able to narrow down uh, uh, acceptable specified values, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if I want to compare variances, I use an F test. And we'll get into this later. But when you talk about the analysis of variance, ANOVA, then you have an F test to conduct that. So example questions, again, does quench water temperature affect the variation in yield strength? Do harder O-rings reduce the variability in leak pressure? That would be a single tailed F test. In other words, we're going to sh show a one-way deviation. Is the variation in pressure capacity of an air tank within spec? So if we can only accept a certain amount of variation based on this sample, am I within those specs? And we do that all the time for uh, ISO 9000 and, and different uh, quality specs, that type of thing, Six Sigma. So there are these two are the predominant test distributions used, and there are different ways to do those calculations. If you want more information, and you're going to need to look up some uh, t-tests, f-tests, etc., to conduct your experiments, three good resources are listed here. Understanding Design of Experiments by Del Vecchio, uh, 
Engineering Statistics by Montgomery has all of this information in it. It's the required book by the uh, ISE department with the uh, ET 3200 class. And Statistics for Engineers and Scientists by Navidi is also a good resource. All of them have the, the same basic information. This is a pretty simple uh, form of hypothesis testing. And so that's how it works.